you. Hi, thank you all for having me today. I know you all are, um, are chemistry people and, and trace evidence examiners, so I have to say that you know, I'm up here to talk about a, a presentation entitled Never Suck a Dead Man's Hand. So I don't have anything particularly insightful to say to you today. My only goal is to entertain you all for the next hour. I know that we all come from a variety of backgrounds. We all found our way to forensic sciences in our own unique path. And for me, my background is in archaeology. And people say, well, how did you go from archaeology, from digging sites in Germany and in, in Italy? How did you wind up as a crime scene investigator? And so for me, my path has been a little bit convoluted. But you know, I just want to take you on a little bit of a journey and um, tell you how I found my way to be in this room with you all today. But again, you know, to stand up here and talk about myself is a little bit awkward. So I've sort of put a twist on this talk. And, and I'm going to tell you about some of the lessons that I have learned along the way. So when I think back to, you know, what, how did I get interested in the forensic sciences? Like, what was my very first inkling that this was the career path that I would take? And I think back to when I, was, when I was four years old. And I know I was four years old because we had just moved into a brand new house. And um, we were celebrating our first Thanksgiving. And I said to my dad, I said, well, what happened to the pilgrims as we're sitting around the Thanksgiving table? And my dad, who was a Baltimore City police officer and a man of very few words, um, said, they died. <laughs> and I said, all right, what does that mean? And he said, they went up in the sky. So I thought, you know, all right, the pilgrims are in the sky. Well, our house, our brand new house, as I said, we had just moved into this. This was the fourth house in a neighborhood that would eventually encompass 400 houses. So for the next couple of days, I looked out the window looking for the pilgrims that were in the sky. And as I asked him additional questions, he said they went with the man in the sky. So as I looked out the window, I saw the Baltimore gas and electric truck putting up the electric line. So it was probably until I was in fifth grade that I thought the pilgrims were in the cherry picker. And that when you died, you went with the man in the sky and the cherry picker. So you know, I always had this sort of interest in the cherry picker. And every time I thought of the Nina and the Pinta and the Santa Maria, I thought of Baltimore gas and electric. My dad also made me question a lot of things. He told me in very few words, don't eat the fortune cookies. I would say, why? He would tell me they're covered in shellac. They'll make you die. Go in the cherry picker. So <laughs> I never ate fortune cookies. It, actually, and I kid you not, it wasn't until I was in college I ate my first fortune cookie. He told me that guys that had really short haircuts, and I look out at some of you, guys that had buzz cuts had short hair because they had lice from putting their head on the seats at the movie theaters. <laughs> And uh, so, you know, there would be birthday parties, and all the other kids would be sitting back, relaxing. And there's Dana and Chris, like, leaning all the way forward because we didn't want to get lice from the, uh, from the movie theaters. My mother was just as crazy. And I tell you nothing I don't say to her face. She had all of these ridiculous superstitions. My mother is Sicilian. And I would say, well, what does that mean? And she would say, it means we make square pizzas. She also was a woman of very few words. So she had us kissing moldy bread for good luck. She told us if we put shoes on any surface higher than our head, our feet would catch on fire. That babies that were born with a lot of hair meant their mothers had indigestion when they were pregnant. If our skirt, if the hem on our skirt was turned up during church, we had to spit on it and kiss. So there was a lot of spitting going on in church. That if my dad dropped a pair of scissors, it meant he was cheating on her. If we dropped a comb, we had to step on it, count to three, say rabbit, 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 and hit somebody. And <laughs> Something that you would all appreciate, the first day of every month, we had to pluck a hair out of our head, say, rabbit, 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 make a wish, and also hit somebody. And I calculate that, to date, I have lost 488 hairs. And I now have my husband plucking hairs, my kids that are one and four are plucking. Everybody plucks hairs in my family. We don't know why we do it. We're just afraid that if we don't do it, something bad is going to happen. But you know, my mother's bizarre behavior really came to a, a head with her Uncle Sal. She told us to stay away from Uncle Sal because he had an extra head in his pants. And as an adult, that means something a little bit different than it meant as a 
young child, but we were petrified because he had an extra head in his pants. So as we got a little bit older, she told us that he, you know, she, she sort of elaborated on the story and said, stay away from him. He's got his dead twin in his butt. So we're like, what are you talking about? So he would come and we would go running. We would say, how did he get a dead twin in his butt? And she told us because his mother touched a hunchback when she was pregnant. As it turns out, Uncle Sal has something which is kind of interesting. It's called a teratoma, when in utero, um, two fetuses that are that are meant to be twins, one sort of envelops the other one, and what you get in one child is a cyst that tends to have bone and hair and teeth coming out of it, but my mother's way of explaining it was that Uncle Sal had a dead twin in his butt. So, you know, I learned to ask a lot of questions from a very early age, and this was my, this is the first lesson that I'll share with you. My dad told us that Ninth Dynasty mummies lived in the backyard, um, Egyptian mummies, that they used to pan for gold and found it in the stream behind our house, and that the, those freaky twins from The Shining used to live in the farmhouse down the street. So, you know, <laughs> I spent my summers outside looking for mummies and gold and the scary twins, and, you know, I didn't find things that were old or dead or scary. And this is when I learned my next lesson, which was about integrity, about salting the pot. Because I didn't find these things, I thought, well, I'm going to bury my own stuff. So I got into the china cabinet when I was about 10 years old and decided I was going to steal all my mother's wedding china and silver and bury it in the flower bed out front. So she comes home from work and notices that the china cabinet is empty, calls the police, the police come, they notice the flower bed is dug up and there's all the china and forks and knives sticking out of it and they're like, Dana? What have you been doing? So, you know, I had a lot of explaining to do. The problem was that that occurred the day after I decided to burn all my Barbies, which was a week after they found my collection of dead animals and roadkill that I had been hiding under my bed. <laughs> so, you know, growing up was interesting, and I was in, in trouble quite a bit, but probably the... Uh, the biggest lesson, and maybe the thing that foreshadows my future career the most, was about a month later, when my mother came home from work, a month after these three incidents, came home from work and saw that there was a pot boiling on the stove. Well, I'm from Maryland, and in Maryland we don't have a whole lot of stuff, but we do have crabs, and you don't mess with the crab pot. So my mother comes home from work and sees the huge crab pot on the stove just simmering away, takes the lid off of it and sees that there's eight cat carcasses in there. And so she is, of course, horrified, absolutely horrified. I tried to explain that in my anatomy class, which was really the only class in high school that got me excited and sort of answered some of the many questions that I had, the teacher offered extra credit if we, for somebody that would take the cat carcasses home and boil them, boil them to get to the bones. So she comes home from work and not knowing this information, takes the lid off the crab pot and sees eight cats in there after I burned the Barbies and had the dead animals under the bed and the dishes in the front yard. So nonetheless, I spent some time talking to a, a nice man laying on a sofa. But I do have to go back to the cat carcass incident for a minute because after all of that, you know, I got in huge trouble. She threw the cat the pot, the crab pot on the deck so my dad could see what I had been doing. As it turned out, it was winter. The cats froze in the crab pot, so I couldn't get them out to take them to school. So not only did I get grounded, I ruined the cat pot, or the crab pot, because it got warped from the ice, and I didn't have the bones to take to school. And then the whole class was mad at me because we had to study the, the skeletal system from a book. So. Anyway, I spent a lot of time talking to the nice man on the sofa, and when it came time to start thinking about college, I told my parents, you know, I want to study archaeology. That's the only thing I want to study. I don't want to study anything else. And my mother um, wanted me to study something where I would get a job, and she wanted me to study something where I would wear a dress to work, and I guess archaeology didn't really meet her criteria. So. Somehow I found myself enrolled at the Union Memorial Hospital School of Nursing, which was the absolute worst experience of my entire life. Um, I took my nursing courses 
at the hospital and I took my bachelor's courses at College of Notre Dame of Maryland. And if you look at the acronym of C-O-N-D-O-M, condom, you'll see, I guess, why College of Notre Dame of Maryland didn't really have sweatshirts made out with, you know, advertising <laughs> where we came from. <clears throat> but anyway, I stayed in nursing school long enough to, um, to catheterize a man who really liked it, which was horrible. And he wanted me to catheterize him every day. He told me he couldn't pee and would chase me around the halls with tubes, like, shove it in. And, uh, and then I got to shave a dead man, which led me to my next lesson that would carry over into my career as a forensic scientist and diligence. And you know, I went one day, I had a, a diabetic patient. This was the day that I quit. And uh, I said, he's, you know, he's cold and he's hard and he's not moving. And she told me to go shave him. So I said, you yeah, know, all right, whatever. So I, I go in there, and he had a nasal cannula, and it was hissing, and his eyes were open, and he was just really, something wasn't right. And I would go back out, and I would get these lectures about what it's like to be in a coma, and you don't move, and you're, you're not responsive. And I'd be like, he is cold, though, and he's not. Mo-. So she just kept telling me to shave him. So, and you know, for you ladies out there, how do you shave a man? Do you shave him down or up or this way? Like, how do you do it? So I'm shaving him, and it's like a patchwork quilt, and he's got nits all over him, but he's not bleeding. I go out, I say, he's, he's looking at me like this, and he hasn't moved, and he's not bleeding. So they had me continue to shave him. So anyway, I, I did quite a number on him, and then they pronounced him dead. So, so that was the day that I quit nursing school, and I showed back up on my parents' sofa. Yeah, literally, I quit. They had no idea. I showed back up that night with all my bags and said, I need to study archaeology. This is I shaved a dead man. There's a man that wanted me to catheterize him. What's the deal? Get me out of there. So I said, I need, I want to study archaeology or I will be on this sofa until I'm 50. So I wound up in an archaeology program. And for the first time, I, you know, I went from barely passing school to having a 4-0 in my major. I did an entire bachelor's program in two and a half years. I mean, it was like, is this the same Dana? Um, when I was studying for my bachelor's in archaeology, I happened to land an internship with the Maryland Historical Trust, which is where all of the skeletal collections in our state are curated. And I knew nothing about bones, and it was on the skeletal collection that I taught myself the difference between a fibula and a femur and a radius and an ulna. And I played around with these bones for an entire summer, and by the end of the summer, I had a fairly good handle on at least how to distinguish human from animal bone. I knew all the bones. I could side all the bones. And I could tell, you know, with, within reason, age of, of an individual. When I graduated from college, I immediately, within a month, landed a job with the Maryland State Highway Administration. My mother was horrified because, as you can tell, I wasn't wearing a dress to work. Um, but I did the archaeology before they built roads and before they built bridges. This led into me taking positions with a few other companies that did national archaeology work. I did, I worked for an engineering company, one in, I worked for many, but one in particular that, that I stayed with for about four years, and we did contracts for Army Corps of Engineers, and I worked on sites all the way from Canada to the Carolinas to Europe. And it became known, though, that I was the bone girl. I was the cemetery girl, you know, that this person is, has done an internship with human skeletal remains. And as it turned out, I started getting assigned to all of the cemetery relocation projects. And in this day where development is just ongoing, um, you know, there's a lot of cemeteries that are getting impacted. And frequently, these have to be excavated and the bodies move. So my mother would sit at home, you know, just saying her, her rosary, oh, she's a grave digger. My daughter's a grave digger. So I dug cemeteries for a number of years and was actually quite happy doing it, as you can tell from that particular photograph. But nonetheless, in, in this particular photograph, all you have to do is know a little bit about soil stratigraphy. And that dark stain in the middle on the photo on the bottom right-hand side is about a 1,000-year-old um, prehistoric grave. So you know, there's really not a whole lot that uh, not a whole lot that goes into at least identifying these things. 
as, as I traveled around and was doing the archaeology and, and, um, and grave exhumations, I became obviously interested in forensic sciences. You know, how can you not ask the question, is this a contemporary grave? Is this a prehistoric grave? If you were to bury somebody, how long would it take for them to decompose? You know, all of the questions that I'm sure many of you guys have pondered at one point in your life. So I decided it was time to go back to school. I was tired of living out of hotels. And I had applied to a, a couple different graduate programs, but the one that really sort of caught my eye was George Washington. And it caught my eye for a number of reasons. Number one, they had a really good anthropology program, but they also had a forensic science program, and they also had ties to the Smithsonian Institution, to Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, to a number of different places that, would have been, that were wonderful for me to um, to do internships. So <clears throat> I enrolled at George Washington University in their forensic science program. However, I took more courses than I can even count in their, in their anthropology program. When I graduated, you know, you hear stories about people that look for a job for eons. When I graduated, I was immediately offered two positions, one with Baltimore County Police Department as a crime scene investigator, and the other one with the Smithsonian Institution as a physical anthropologist. And you know, what do you do? How do you choose a, a, a position like that? Well, you know, my mother and her, her rational mind started chattering in the back of my head. And you know, with the Smithsonian Institution, it was a, contra it was a contractual position. It would have to be renewed year to year. The pay wasn't great. There was a commute issue. And you know, when you think about it, what are the first positions to be cut when the federal government is in a crunch and it's these research positions. So I sort of finagled a deal, and I took the job with Baltimore County, but the same week I also started working part-time for the Smithsonian Institution. And this is where my career path sort of t takes a, a fork in the road, if you will. And I'll talk about both just, to, just briefly. With the Smithsonian, I've had wonderful experiences. I've been with them for 14 years. I continue to work for them on a part-time basis. And primarily, the work that we did was to travel to museums across the country, and in some cases in Europe, and do examinations of curated skeletal collections. Um, one of the issues that we face as physical anthropologists is repatriation, and that being that Native Americans won all the bones of their ancestors to be reburied. So before we rebury them, we want to do as much of an analysis as we possibly can. These that you see before you are basket maker skeletons that come from Utah. Um, they're mummies slash skeletons. On the image on the left, you'll see in that infant's abdomen, there's a, a jumble of what looks like cord, and that's actually human hair. We call these basket makers because these individuals made phenomenal baskets. They were known for basketry. On the image on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see that they even used the baskets to bury their dead. Um, although on the, on the image on the right, it's difficult to see. If you look carefully at the feet of that infant, you can also see some, some cord. And here's one of the first overlaps um, between forensic sciences and archaeology. We know through DNA that that, that cord is actually made out, as, as I said, of human hair. And it's the hair of the infant's mothers when these babies would die the mothers would cut their hair and braid it and make carrying handles for these interment baskets. With the Smithsonian, we did a number of, of field excavations, too. This is in Manassas, Virginia. They were building a McDonald's, and the backhoe unearthed a skull. And as it turned out, there were a number of human burials that were located. We went out there and um, using probes and ground penetrating radar, identified a number of interments, and these turned out to be members of the first um, Massachusetts infantry that were killed. This was an unmarked cemetery. The image that you see now, that hole in the side of this guy's head, we thought it was from a tree root. And in doing radiographs, we, we identified lead wipe, so we know that this guy died from a gunshot wound to the head. And of course, when these guys were buried, they were buried um, with full military honors. We also did a lot of work in the former Yugoslavia, both forensic work and archaeological work. 
This individual here was a plague victim. Um, when individuals died of the plague, as you can imagine, they wouldn't want them buried anywhere near the remaining population, so they would drop them in limestone caves. So for several hundred years, this individual, along with 23 others, laid on the floor of a cave and calcium carbonate just dripped and dripped and dripped and encased these bodies in stone. And to do the skeletal examination, we had to soak them in hydrochloric acid. And you can see on the right side of the skull, as you look at it, the, um, the area that's devoid of the bone is the area that we've soaked, and the other side isn't. We also made four trips to do mass grave exhumations. Um, this is a Serbian cemetery in the former Yugoslavia. You can see the mortar fire that's completely destroyed that church. And in the center of that headstone, there's a, a bullet hole. So, you know, nobody was, no, no person or no area was really safe from gunfire. But um, we excavated, I believe it was 14 mass graves and documented injuries. This is the distal humerus or the elbow, and you can see the, um, the projectile protruding from it, gunshot wounds all over the place. Anybody know what would have caused this? This is a femur injury like this. It's a landmine. And one of the sites that we worked on was called Vukovar, and Vukovar made the news quite a, quite a bit. Vukovar was a hospital where the Serbs had lined up all of the doctors, nurses, and patients and executed them all. And in many situations, in many instances, we were able to identify why these individuals were in the hospital to start with. This person has an external fixation device, which um, turned out to be the least of his problems. We also saw injuries that we really don't see in the, in the Western world. Um, most of the people that were killed during the war were old peasant farmers. You know, the, they weren't 18 to 22 year old young guys like we see being killed in, in contemporary wars. These were, you know, these were truly innocent victims. And in this particular case, this isn't a war injury. This guy had broken his leg. And if you look near that hole in the center, you can see the fracture line. This was an open fracture that was never set. And when the bone was pulled back in, Along with it came bacteria, and this person developed a, an acute case of osteomyelitis. That hole that you see would have been a, a pus drainage hole that probably would have drained through the skin. So this is probably why um, with this person, had they not been shot in the head, probably would have died of this particular injury. But just to give you an idea of the types of people that were being killed during this war. So again, phenomenal experiences. Probably one of the most interesting cases that we worked on in Croatia was this guy here. Um, what you're looking at are the, are the margins of the scapulae or the shoulder blades, and they're rippled. They sort of have a, you know, a, a wavy margin to them. And when we started working there, at least the first two trips that we made, they weren't doing DNA to identify the people. We were using presumptive identifications. And, Probably one of the things that surprised us the most when we went out there was that, you know, most people knew who was in these graves and most people knew where the graves were. You know, it's a scare tactic to leave some people living. So they would make some elderly women watch as they killed men and, and, and children and, um, you know, to pass the word they, they, that they meant business. So anyway, when we went to this village, we said, you know, we've got this guy, he's between 22 and 24 years old, and he's got these wavy scapulae. And, you know, in the morgue, for weeks, we were walking around like, what could he have engaged in that would have sort of molded his shoulder blades to look like that? He also had some alterations to the clavicles and to the humeri. And we determined that whatever he was doing, he was engaged in a motion like this. So, you know, we sit down with the families and we're like, he's 22 to 24, he was a smoker, and he did this. And, you know, we look like a bunch of freaks, but immediately they're like, that's Dvorak Stranovich. And we said, well, okay, what did he do? This was the one guy that had left the village, had actually gone to the university, and had won awards as a scholar. He was a champion scholar. So, you know, we were able to really identify him. And this one I have to show you. Um, as I mentioned in Vukovar, we worked on individuals that were killed in the hospital. And in many instances, as I have said previously, we could identify why they were in the hospital to start with. 
This person had their, their hand amputated. Um, you can still see the saw blades, the striations on the radius and ulna. You're looking at the, at the wrist right here. But if you look at the left hand side of the screen, you can see a, a little divot, um, which is a, let me try and point it out here, right here, which is a false start where they put the saw blade in and then pulled it out. So bring a little bit of reality to the whole situation. And we also worked on a number of Catholic priests, and this had nothing to do with the contemporary war. These guys were killed under Tito. And you know, to go through about 200 bags that contain about you know, 100 Catholic priests, along with their vestments and crucifixes and everything that have execution shots to the back of the head and exits to the face is pretty, you know, pretty, uh, a pretty humbling experience, somber experience. Um, but with the Smithsonian, we also worked on a number of other interesting cases. Um, Wild Bill Longley, this was in Giddings, Texas. Wild Bill was a Texas gunfighter that was suspected of killing at least 15 people, 14 or 15 people. And there was a, a, a rumor that was going around town that when Wild Bill was actually caught and hanged for his crimes, he had on a harness. And so while the townspeople viewed his execution, when everybody left, he actually got up on his feet and walked away, and one of the town vagrants was buried in his grave. So it was our job to, number one, go out there and find the unmarked, cemetery, the unmarked grave of Wild Bill, and number two, um, determine if he was, in fact, in there or if it was somebody else in there. The problem was that Wild Bill was buried in, at the time, which was a tiny cemetery, in contemporary times, it contained over a thousand people, and it was an unmarked cemetery. So you're, we were literally looking for a needle in a haystack, but um, using some reverse triangulation from newspaper clippings. And for those of you that are interested, I can tell you more about how we found him later. We nonetheless found a um, a grave, an unmarked grave. Two of the two of the uh, stories that sort of surrounded. The burial of Wild Bill were, number one, he was buried in his stacked heel boots, and number two, he converted to Christianity right before he was hanged and had a miraculous medal around his neck. So as we excavated the skeleton, we found stacked heel boots along with the miraculous medal around his neck. Um, we also worked on a number of different Civil War cemeteries, um, some clearly marked like these and some you know, just a little bit more difficult to discern. So, so, so lots of cemetery experience, but perhaps my favorite experience in working with the Smithsonian was working on the Hunley, which is a Civil War submarine. Um, <clears throat> and the, for those Civil War aficionados, I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about. The Hunley was sank, oops, was sunk by the Housatonic. It was a boiler that was actually turned into a submarine. And when it went down, it had Lieutenant Dixon along with eight other crewmen on board. And so we got to um, excavate the remains of those individuals that, that were inside and talk about just an amazing experience. These people had been buried in mud since the, since the boat had gone down. So you know there was adipose here. We were finding head hairs, beard hairs, pubic hairs. Of course, there was fabric, um, just an amazing burial environment and amazing in terms of um, of preservation as well. And when these individuals were buried again, with, they were buried with full military honors. But it was probably the Hunley that taught me my next lesson that would carry over, and that was ingenuity. And use adipose to your advantage. And what do I mean by that? Well, working on the Hunley, the last day, um, as it turned out, I got a phone call from Baltimore County and they needed me to come back to work. I thought that my leave was approved for longer. So as it turned out, I had to catch a flight and hurry up and get home for work. I worked midnight shift for 10.30 that night. So I completely didn't expect that I had to leave that day. So I literally get out of the submarine, jump in a car and go to the airport. And you know, I'm, I've been working on these guys all day. I've got, you know, I'm pretty nasty. But I, it's kind of like perfume, though. You don't smell it if you kind of are enveloped by it all day. So, so I run to the airport, um, and I found out later it didn't help. I had a big mud handprint down the side of my face. I didn't know it at the time. But I get on the airplane, 
and I sit down, and of course I've got the middle seat. There's a woman all dressed up on one side of me next to the window and a man in a suit on the other side. So he requests a seat change almost immediately. And then the woman requests a seat change, and the next thing that I know, they moved me up to first class where there was nobody. So <laughs> if you ever want to be upgraded or get to first class, just cover yourself in adipose here. Um, <laughs> which was only one of many airline experiences that I had. Um, when, I was, when I was coming back from Utah, I was coming back and uh, we had been working on the basket maker skeletons that you've already seen. And at the very last minute, the individual that I worked for, Dr. Owsley, Doug Owsley, said, hey, Dana, can you, can you take these boxes of skulls back to the museum for me? He said, oh, yeah, give them to me. So it was three long boxes packed with heads. And I'm not thinking, and I'm late, of course. Throw them on the scanner. They're my carry-on. And the scanner just stops. <laughs> and then it backs up. And then it goes forward. And then it backs up. And the guy's looking at me. Then he calls his boss. And so I kind of reposition myself to look around to see the screen. And I see what you see right there, all these heads <laughs> looking up. So I make the mistake of trying to make a joke out of it. And, and I say, they don't eat peanuts, you know? <laughs> They're easy. They don't talk much. And they didn't think it was funny. So uh, yeah, so I got whisked off by the police, and it was a long experience. Missed my flight. So don't put dead people in your carry-on baggage. The, the other thing, the worst part was they wanted to see museum identification, which, like an idiot, was packed in my luggage underneath the plane. So I had, here I am just showing up with eight people in my carry on, which was only one of, one of many mass transportation disasters when in DC I was traveling with somebody else and she thought I had Miss Wiggins legs and I thought she had Miss Wiggins legs and Miss Wiggins legs went on a trip all around Washington and we had to go to DC Metro and report a lost bag and when they asked what it was we're like it's a pair of legs. Um, <laughs> so I got called in by the police again only to have the police come to my house. And this is probably one of my favorite stories ever. Um, you know, sort of in the vein of my father, who didn't tell us a whole lot of information. I had been working on a cemetery, a slave, an African-American slave cemetery in um, one of the counties surrounding Baltimore. And as it turned out, these individuals that, um, that we had exhumed, I think it was 23 people, we had exhumed, um, we had no place to put them, so I just brought them home. And I didn't have anything to put them in, so I went to the liquor store and I got beer boxes. And I had each person in a beer box, and they were stacked up in my garage. Well, as it turned out, um, I was having a slow day in the crime lab, so I decided I was going to swing by my house and clean off these skeletons. My husband had got, my husband's an archaeologist, he had gotten the contract to do the archaeology on the site, and I had the contract to do the physical anthropology. So, you know, I'm sort of playing both cards at the same time, and I swing home from, from work, and I decide that I'm going to clean off these skeletons. They were covered in sand. So I've got them all laid out in the backyard, only to have my next-door neighbor's barbecue grill catch their house on fire, which caught the tree on fire, and the tree is intertangled with my tree, and I hear the fire engines coming, and all I can think is that Baltimore County is going to show up and they're going to see that I'm home and I've got 23 dead people in the yard and I'm going to get in trouble for being at home. So I'm trying to clean up all these people. So it turned, that turned into a, a disaster only to get worse because, you know, I sort of averted that, that crisis. The, um, the individual that we were doing this contract for had called me at a, a few days later and said, you know, the, um, this was an almshouse, a, a, um, a potter's field, if you will. They said the community wants to pitch in and they want to buy coffins for these individuals and they want to do a, they want to do a, you know, a ceremony. They want to bury these people right. So I need you to call around and get prices on coffins. We'll pay for it. You've got $2,000. $2,000 doesn't buy a lot when it comes to coffins. So I call a funeral home and I said, yeah, I want to buy a coffin. And it didn't go over well. And it was a young girl on the phone and she, she says, what? I said, can I buy a coffin? She says, um, well, is the person going to be laid out here? I said, no, I, they're not going to be laid out anywhere. I just need to bury them. And uh, <laughs> she said, 
well, where are they? And I said, in beer boxes in the garage. <laughs> and so she puts me on hold and comes back, and she says, where did they come from? I said, I dug them up out of a cemetery. <laughs> so she puts me on hold again, and uh, her boss gets on the phone and says, can I help you? I said, yeah, I got 23 people, I got $2,000, and I need to get a coffin. So he's like, where did you get them from? I tell him, yeah, they're in beer boxes. I dug them up out of the cemetery. So um, you know, he invites me to come in and look at all these fancy schmancy coffins. And I go on to explain, I don't know these people. You can just give me one big one for all I care. Just give me a coffin. So anyway, the uh, police showed up at my house again to further investigate that. As it turned out, um, you know, I, had, I wound up getting letters from the state's attorney. And, Everything worked out well, except I live in a, in a really, um, um, how do I phrase it? We're kind of like the Be Beverly Hillbillies of my neighborhood. We live in a nice neighborhood, and then there's us. So um, the funeral home decided after they found out about, you know, that this was an almshouse and that, you know, we were doing a good thing, they were going to donate the coffin. So they started showing up at my house, dropping off coffins on the front yard for me to sort of assess the size. And they were bringing, I guess like if you're a big person, you can get really big coffins. But when you got 23 people, 23 heads, that's, you know, you need a lot of room. The heads primarily. So all the neighbors are like looking out the window and they're bringing the coffins by. Well, they eventually wind up building a coffin for us, a huge coffin with the coffin handles and the hardware. The problem was that the coffin didn't fit in the back of my car. And as it turned out, I had to go out of town with the Smithsonian. So my husband had to drive down Interstate 95 with a coffin stuck to the roof rack. And uh, he got pulled over by the state police. <laughs> so anyway, I've told you some of the lessons that I learned with the, with the Smithsonian. I also learned a lot with Baltimore County Police Department. Um, first of all, skepticism. Crime scenes aren't blue. And anybody that watches CSI, I just don't understand where all those blue colors come from, you know. Um, <clears throat> as you can tell in these particular photographs, our labs are anything but blue, and our people are anything but blue. Our evidence is anything but blue. Um, I also learned that, you know, on TV, they do all these fancy experiments. He's electrocuting a pickle. And, it, you know, this was the reality of the job that we did. You know, the, the Keith is particularly interested in a latex glove. Notice no pickles in the background. And I thought I'd get to go there and dress all sexy and have my hair <laughs> bobbing around. And <laughs> that's what I wore to work. So you know, t so TV lies. But I did get, there were a number of cases where I did get to overlap my physical anthropology and my archaeology and my forensic training. and. Um, there were a, a number of cases where individuals had been murdered and buried. And you know, as we say, my day starts when yours ends. It was unfortunate for them, but this was the kind of stuff that I really enjoyed working on. Um, and then there were a couple cases and some, and some pretty um, newsworthy cases where I also got to combine all of my skills. This was a, um, a case involving a young girl named Gina Newsline. Um, the individual that murdered her was Baltimore City Police Sergeant James Colbicki. And the two of them had been having an affair when she she eventually became pregnant and had a child. And it wasn't until she threatened to sue him for, um, for child support that he decided to kill her, primarily because then his wife would find out that, number one, he had been having an affair. And number two, he had had a child. So police did search warrants. They found her blood on his clothing. They found her blood in his car. Um, he had cleaned out the car right after the murder. That looks like blood on the floor there, when in fact it's bleach that's puddled under the floor. Um, this is a mid-range shot looking through from the driver's side to the passenger side. It was a dual cab pickup truck. And you can see that busted out piece of plastic um, next to the window, which we believe that the, at the time the bullet struck. We know, in fact, that's the truth now. Um, and a close-up photograph of that. Um, we found her blood in the car. Oops. 
This was a UV shot. I don't know why that's not coming up. Um, blood puddled underneath of the rear seats. When we asked Colbicki, you know, how is it you've got all this blood puddled underneath of the rear seats of the car? He said it was his wife's menstrual blood. She needed to go to the doctor. Um, and, you know, in the vehicle when, we're, when we were done with it. So, so anyway, in this particular case, um, Colbicki was convicted. He eventually uh, appealed the conviction. And I got involved in the second phase of testing when um, the state's attorney's office asked me to go through the vacuum samples and see if I could identify anything that could possibly be bone. And so I went through about 14 bags of vacuum samples and pulled out, I think, six quote unquote things that I thought could possibly be bone. And when I say things, I mean it literally. They were about as small as the tip of a pencil, tiny little things. You know, they could have been dried up corners of french fries or they could have been bone. Well, I, um, it was one of the cases where I got to take off my Baltimore County uniform and sort of put on my Smithsonian hat because these bones were eventually sent to the individual that I work for at the museum and I got to follow the case through on that end. And um, using scanning electron microscopy, we identified that they were in fact human bone. There was lead wipe on them, so we knew that a piece of lead, i.e. a bullet, had passed through them. And using mitochondrial DNA, we identified it as Gina Neuslein's bone. So when the case went back to court, we had even better evidence that, you know, now not only do you have her blood in the car, we got a piece of her head underneath of your seat. And of course, Kalbicki is still whining and moaning that, that he didn't do it. There was another case where I got to wear two hats, too. It was an individual, her name was Marion Cusimano, and she was a, a younger woman in her maybe late 40s, early 50s that happened to be in a nursing home because she had multiple sclerosis. And she had been having conversations with one of the nurse's aides in the nursing home, and the aide said, if you check out of the nursing home, move back into your home, I'll quit my job and I'll move in and I'll take care of you. And that's exactly what Marion did. She didn't have any family, and so she checked herself out of the nursing home, moved into the house with the nurse's aide. The nurse's aide shut the door, never opened it again, moved her entire family into the home, and Marion Cusimano eventually died um, from neglect. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the Smithsonian got involved because you know, we have, when, when the body was eventually found, she was completely decomposed. I mean, even the maggots were dead. There was nothing left of her. So um, we wanted to try to prove that she had died through neglect. And it's really difficult to do that when you have only a skeleton left. There was some head hair, there were fingernails, and there were bones. So we decided that we would use stable isotopes. And the idea was that when she was in the nursing home, she would have received adequate nutrition, so um, isotope levels should be at, at one particular level, particularly carbon and nitrogen, should be at one level. And then when she was quote unquote cared for at home, they should have dropped. So calculating how quickly hair grows, calculating how quickly fingernails grow, we took the terminal ends of the hair and terminal ends of the fingernails or the quick ends of the fingernails, which would have been the areas that would have grown while she was being neglected, took samples, and then, or I'm sorry, the base ends, and then took the terminal ends, which would have been the areas that would have grown when she was in the nursing home. So again, that was another case where I got to wear both hats. But probably the best lesson that I ever learned, whether it be from my parents or in physical anthropology or with crime scene investigation, was never suck a dead man's hand. And people always say, well, where on earth, is, which is, happens to be the title of the book that I wrote, people say, well, where on earth did that title come from? And you know, forensics is all about thinking outside the box. You know, it's kind of staying one step ahead of the game. And there was a fatal car accident that had occurred in um, a, a pretty rural area of Maryland. And the traffic investigator had called and said, Dana, can you come out here and fingerprint the dead guy? And you know, this sort of gets into one of those forensic catch-22s. We can't do anything to alter a body before it goes to the morgue. And that includes putting fingerprint ink on the fingers. However, you know, the flip side of that is it was a, you know, there was nothing suspicious about this crash, nothing at all. 
And you know, if I didn't, I worked midnight shift. If I didn't get this guy's ID, if I didn't fingerprint him, immediately he wouldn't be autopsy. The accident happened at two in the morning. He wouldn't be autopsied until probably ten. By the time they were done with them, maybe one o'clock, I could fingerprint him, drive the fingerprints back to headquarters. They put them in the system. It's going to be dinner time before this family is told that this guy is, has been killed in a car accident. So the traffic investigator said, you know, I know you did something sneaky on another scene. Can you do that here? Which, you know, that should be another lesson. You do, you do something nice for somebody and it turns into a job description. So I'm like, ugh. So I drive all the way out there. It was freezing cold, the, you know, absolutely bitter cold. The wind was just ripping at me. I get out there, and this guy was an absolute mess. He was smoking. He had the window down because he was smoking, was unrestrained, hit a patch of ice, was ejected, and then hit by his own car. And so he was just a, you know, a smear, literally, in the middle of this cornfield. So I squat down to get his fingerprints, and his hands are in full rigor. He had been out there for, for quite a while. So I'm trying as hard as I can to pry his finger up to try to you know, see if I can get a, a fingerprint. And I was going to do it by just taking his finger and rolling it on a fingerprint card and then dusting the card. You know, that was my way around introducing anything to his fingertips. So, you know, I struggle, I struggle, I pull his finger up, slap it on the fingerprint card, dust it, and no fingerprint came up. Meanwhile, I have to emphasize my, I, I could not have been colder. The wind was, was, was so fierce that the tears coming out of the corner of my eyes were like going up. I had extra large gloves on because I hadn't done my vehicle inspection and had checked that I had mediums and I didn't. So the fingertips of my gloves are out to here. I couldn't have been any colder, so I told the traffic investigator, That's, I can't do it, he's just got to be ID'd at the, at the morgue tomorrow, they got to print him there. So, you know, crime lab is the best thing when we get what people want and we suck when, you know, we don't get the results that they want. So they're like, oh, civilians are the worst thing that's ever happened to this crime lab. And, you know, they're all hemming and hauling. So I thought, all right, I'm going to try one more thing. And this is where thinking outside the box gets you in trouble. You know, I wasn't getting fingerprints because he was freezing cold. I needed to reintroduce some humidity to his fingers. So, you know, to save the, the name of the civilians, I go back and I pry up his finger and I'm looking at the traffic investigator and I go, ah, stick it in my finger, in my, stick the guy's finger in my mouth, slap it on a fingerprint card, dust it, and a beautiful fingerprint came out. Absolutely gorgeous fingerprint. So, you know, of course, he's like, oh, civilians, the cops never would have done that. You know, now we're the best thing. <laughs> so, so I get the first fingerprint, and I'm not happy, and I'm freezing cold. The gloves are too big. I get to the second finger, and I'm prying it up because he's in rigor. Get it in my mouth, slap it down, fingerprint. Gorgeous print comes up, and we have a system going. He's handing me the cards as I'm fingerprinting, and I get to the ninth finger, and just as I'm trying to pry up this finger, I'm thinking, my gloves are bloody, I'm cold, I need to change. So, and, but on the other side, there's another voice echoing in my ear, you've only got two more to do, only two more. So I pry up the next to the last finger, the ring finger, open my mouth, get it in, and I don't know what happened, I just know I lose grip, I hand go around. He goes back into rigor, so I tell her, I'm rolling around. police officers, they're all bent in half. They're laughing so hard. And I got a dead man's hand stuck in my mouth. So anyway, I eventually managed to get it out. I have to also add that every time I pull away, like the whole guy is coming <laughs> with me. So I get the hand out of my mouth and, you know, I've got blood. It's an exposure. It was a mess. I start gargling with isopropyl alcohol, not knowing that that's toxic, which is a whole <laughs> another thing. Made another trip to see the hospital. But uh, anyway, so after I got cleaned up, I told all of them, I'm like, so help me God, what happened in this cornfield? If it leaves this cornfield, I will kill you, your family, your mother, your father, your kid. I'll kill everybody. So I hadn't even gotten to my van, and my KDT, the little computer in the police cars, is just going bzz, bzz. People from like the complete opposite end of the county 
know what's happening. They're like, we hear crime lab sucking the dead man's hand. <laughs> so from that point, and you know, and I would like to say that this happened late or early in my career. This happened like right before I quit. So you know, you continue to learn lessons along the way. Um, but anyway, so when I eventually I, I, I left my job, I left the police department. No, they didn't fire me. I chose to to leave and pursue some other options. But but nonetheless, I decided that you know I was gonna just kind of throw the idea out there and see if anybody was interested in some of these absolutely ridiculous sort of you don't see this on CSI type stories. And and quickly, very quickly, I. Um, wound up with a, a publisher, and, or I'm sorry, with an agent who happened to be Patricia Cornwell's agent for her first two books, and, um, and a publisher. And initially, when I was talking to the agent, though, he was kind of suspicious, and he asked me to tell a story, you know, kind of what I was thinking, like, you know, in the genre of the book. And I told him that story, and he was totally silent, like, didn't say a word, he was horrified. And uh, he said, You think that's funny? <laughs> I said, kinda, <laughs> don't you? So then he goes, well, what's the moral of that story? And I said, I don't know that any of my stories really have morals. And I said, never suck a dead man's hand? And so then he sort of lightened up and he said, I'll take you as a client if that's the title of your book. So <laughs> anyway, what am I doing now? I don't know what I'm doing. Um, I've been working in Guatemala on curated skeletal collections and, um, and, and field exhumations as well of tombs of the Mayan elite that come from the, um, the pyramids in the Mirador Basin. I teach full time and over the summer I've been doing a number of Make My Mother Proud cemetery exhumations <laughs> in Maryland. So anyway, I know we all have our own stories, we all came together in our own sort of way, and we all could tell just as ridiculous and crazy stories. So I know that what I share with you are just one of many, many stories that you could all tell. So thanks for bearing with me. I appreciate it.